Well, good afternoon, everybody, um, and a warm welcome to our webinar series uh, called Transforming the Future of Land Management. Uh, my name is Matthew Morris. I'm a land steward with the Duchy of Cornwall, and I'm delighted to be your host today, along with Tim Hopkin, who is the founder of the Land App. So we're five weeks in, and as you can see, I have lost valuable habitat as my lockdown haircut went slightly closer than expected. Alas, my sideburns are no longer eligible for any rewilding grants. This is now our fifth episode, and we're beginning to understand just how powerful this sort of collaboration is. We're bringing together a wide cross-section from all across the land management sector, and that's truly exciting. We want to capture as many of your thoughts as we go along. I think the other exciting aspect is the sheer variety of topics that we're able to cover under this heading and also how interlinked they are at multiple levels. Today's session is about creating change on a landscape scale. And I think for those of us that are involved in land management directly, making positive impact on landscape is one of the most rewarding things that we can do. I think back to when I was a junior land agent, I think in my first few weeks, uh, when I was asked to arrange for a small clear fell site to be replanted. It felt insignificant at the time, but now, when I passed it recently and looked across the valley, there it was, all those species choices and planting groups in glorious Technicolor, 20 years on. It's also the impact of those changes on nature in terms of habitat, and that impact, of course, will spread way beyond the boundaries of your specific site. It's also the impact on people. Landscape has an enormous part to play in people's mental well-being. At a CLA meeting this morning, we discussed the stark contrast of living in urban and rural areas and how this has been accentuated during the current crisis. With so much at stake, it's beholden on all of us to get it absolutely right. Just a quick bit of housekeeping for any new recruits. Don't panic, there's not a lot you can break. Your camera and microphone will remain off throughout the session. And in a slight departure from our normal routine, we have three guest speakers today and therefore we're un we will in all likelihood run on slightly beyond the hour, but I'm sure it'll be well worth it. Finally, I'll be running a Q&A at the end of the session as usual, and at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Please use that for asking the guest speakers the questions. You will also see a chat button. Use this if you've got any technical queries relating to the webinar, and Tim will do his best to answer those. And we're also gonna use Slido, which Tim will explain, but the big revelation last week was that using a smartphone to access Slido was way easier than trying to cut and paste links. But more on that from Tim. So that's enough for me for now. Uh, Tim, over to you to give us an overview of the session today and to introduce all of our guest speakers. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Matthew, and welcome um, everyone today. So yes, as Matthew said, my name is Tim Hopkin. Um, I'm the founder of the Land App, which is an easy to use digital mapping tool to help uh, land manage managers make the best decisions on how they use their land and assets. So today um, we have uh, presenting, um, we're going to be started with uh, Jess Brooks from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, who is going to be presenting on farmer-led collaboration. Then we're going to have Geraint Richards from the Duchy of Cornwall, who's going to be presenting landscape scale planning and trees, trees in the landscape. And then finally, we're going to have John Tucker from the Woodland Trust, who will be presenting the why and how of woodland creation, five things to consider. So but before we start with the presentations, uh, you're used to the format now, most of you. Um, I am just going to uh, start Slido. So we have a question today and something that's um, really come off the back of the answers from last week, which is, there's a lot of demand for the educational material, so more educational material. So our question today is, how do we deliver this educational material to you? So I'm just gonna add into the chat function to all of you lot, a link, and I'm gonna hit the present mode and see what the answers come out like. So all you need to do is just jump into the chat uh, button. So you'll see a little chat bu button in your, on your side. Um, on Zoom, if you just open that up, so then you can see the link, you just need to left click on the link, you might need to hit escape on Zoom, so that you can uh, take that link and paste it into your web browser, 
So either left click or, or copy and paste. So educational material, good question, Matt. Um, so anything, it could be an educational platform, more webinars, website, YouTube videos, there you go. You can see a whole lot coming out, case studies, a uh, lot of online, okay, fantastic. So anything, any way that you want to pre present all of this material. Um, just in case some of you are struggling with the link, um, you can also take a photo and get the QR code from Slido up in the top left. So that will give you, um, then you'll be able to answer the questions on your phone. So case studies coming out front and center. So um, Brian McDonald, thank you. Uh, I don't know if I can, unfortunately. Um, uh, oh, you mean stick the material on LinkedIn? Good point. Um, okay, so just, so any ideas, how do we deliver this educational material? All the presentations, all of the, um, all the transcripts that we're capturing, all of this different thought processes that are going on, how do we present that all back to everyone so it's as engaging, as useful, as practical as possible? Um, so case studies, YouTube, webinars, more webinars. <laughs> um, we're doing our best. Um, PDFs, okay, fact sheets. Interesting. You want a lot of interactive material. That's great. Downloadable. Um, more on YouTube. Workshops. That's a really interesting one. Whoever said workshops, there's some ideas. Really interesting to discuss. Podcasts. Fantastic. You might be quite excited about what we've got coming in that case. More videos. Yeah, case studies front and center. Um, if anyone's so with those case studies, if you've got ideas about how you want that to be presented, whether you want it is, yeah, on our website, um, you know, opportunities to engage with people who are presenting their case studies. Again, all of this stuff, how do you want to access this material? Do you want it as flat PDFs or do you want it as engaged in rich material? Interactive, yeah, it's coming up front. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, for those that are struggling, by the way, so I can see 136 people have, have uh, answered. If you are in Zoom, you can just hit escape, grab the chat function, it, it open the chat, and then you can open up into uh, your browser. Alistair, the ability to manage Slido remotely only exposed the land app. No, 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 nothing to do with the land app. This is all just uh, Zoom and Slido. Brilliant. Okay, I'll let you go for a little bit longer. Hopefully, everyone's able to access the link and answer the question, and you can answer as many times as you want. Brilliant. I think we'll stop it for there. That is really very useful. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I'm now going to hit stop and come back out of there. And again, as you have seen before, we're going to make all of these available afterwards, uh, all of the results from Slido available afterwards. So now, to kick off our presentations, we've got Jess Brooks from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, who will be presenting farmer-led collaboration. Jess, I'll stop sharing my screen, and I'll let you start sharing your screen, and unmute yourself, and I'll let you start the presentation. Great, thank you, Jess. If you just unmute yourself as well. I can unmute you if, that's, if you want. Oh, sorry, Jess, you're still muted. There we oh, are. Hello. <laughs> I've lost my Brilliant. Screen. Thank you, Jess. I'll leave you to it. How do I? Am I sharing my screen? There we go. All good? Perfect. We can see it. Yeah, perfectly. Okay. Um, thanks for inviting me to speak on this subject. Um, many of you will have heard of um, what we call farm clusters or facilitated groups. Um, for those that haven't heard about this way of working, um, let me take you back a few years. Um, and we can see um, how this farmer-led landscape scale conservation and collaboration um, really kicked off and came into being. So in 2020, uh, the government funded um, some nature improvement areas, one of which was in the Marlborough Downs. And uh, this involved a group of farmers led by a farmer committee um, with a trusted advisor that they chose themselves, uh, Gemma Batten. Um, and it was a big success. Uh, GWCT, who had been supporting the project, uh, were interested to see if this would work elsewhere without NIA funding. Um, so we set up uh, five pilot farmer clusters in 2013. Um, and what we found was that farmers could collaborate. Um, there were enormous potential benefits for biodiversity, soil and water. Um, as well as community engagement and local business opportunities. 
um, but they really needed an advisor, some some glue, um, and a you know sort of facilitator to keep them all on the straight and narrow, as it were. Um, so Natural England responded to the GWCT pilot report and various other landscape scale initiatives by creating the Countryside Stewardship Facilitation Fund, which really helped the initiative take off. So, I mean, it's just exploded. We've got um, well over a hundred of these landscape scale groups. Um, they're not on the map, but there are some in Wales and Scotland now. Um, so this has really exploded. Um, it's very exciting. Thousands of farms involved, um, over half a million hectares. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how many more have been added to the list since the 2019 round of the facilitation fund. So unsurprisingly, the scale and potential of the cluster movement has been uh, noticed by government and this way of working uh, features in the 25 year environment plan. Uh, it's also being referred to throughout the ELMS discussion document. Um, you can see there um, more effective delivery um, if we join up. Um, a lot of the tests and trials actually feature pharma clusters um, and tier three um, very much geared towards landscape scale as well and it's refreshing to see um, a section in the ELMS discussion document on lessons learned in particular a mention of um, the fact that land managers must have access to effective advice and, and that um, within a cluster is is a really good way of, of delivering that advice. Uh, many of us who are involved with clusters and have been out promoting farmer-led collaboration in uh, farm and media, social media. Um, we've had two farmer cluster conferences and when this COVID thing is out of the way, hopefully we can have another one. Um, a CLA Rural Business, NFU Environment Conference. Um, we've had visits from DEFRA and Manette, president of the NFU. So the idea is, is well circulated now. <coughs> the, um, after the first farm cluster conference we had in conjunction with Natural England, um, we sent out a questionnaire to all facilitators and the main outcome of this uh, was the need and the request for a central resource online um, and a way to help new groups start and, and offer support and inspiration um, to existing groups. So we've created this and um, have had a number of partners helping us and contributing to its growth and its development. So um, definitely check it out and let us know what you think. Sign up to the newsletter. There's a blog. Um, so please do engage with that um, and, and if you've got a profile, keep it up to date. Um, also an online resource coming up in development. Um, the Land App and partners are working on a map of farm groups, which is hoped will be very useful for linking people with initiatives if they're in their um, local area like Three Keels uh, Landscape Enterprise Networks, uh, Environment Bank. Um, as Jenny Phelps outlined in the first session, um, which was interesting. So if you if you've missed that, catch up on it. But um, Land App is linked with UK habitat classification maps, which makes it very useful for um, conservationists. Um, it's also linked to RPA for farm and estate management, and even it's got potential, um, you know, for stewardship applications to be managed through Land App. So I definitely encourage facilitators and farmers to check that out. <coughs> so now I'm going to talk through an example. Um, the Martindale Farm Cluster is the group um, that I look after um, on the edge of Wiltshire, Dorset and Hampshire and we closely abut two other farm clusters to make the Martindown Super Cluster and you can see Martindown National Nature Reserve in the centre there in red um, and surrounding it like spokes for the hub of a wheel we've got um, three groups, one of which was one of the original pilots um, it's called Allenford Farm Cluster and that's one in orange, headed up by Rob Shepherd. Um, and then in 2016, um, Chalk Valley, which is the green area, facilitated by Simon Smart, um, entered and was accepted into the facilitation fund. <coughs> and Martin Down uh, was born in the same year, uh, but Martin Down and Allenford are, are independently funded. Um, so, we all surround the nature reserve. We've got similar aims um, and target species, some of which are um, illustrated there. And we try and work together as closely as possible to try and better buffer that nature reserve and the wildlife to be able to move around um, the region once more. So 
about 236 square kilometres their area and that is I think we'll all agree landscape scale. <coughs> so the Malton Down Farm Cluster uh, has 12 farms in it at the moment. Um, we have quarterly pub meetings, uh, at least six training events, social events and farm walks per year. Um, we've got a friends group which is made up of um, local villagers who um, can get involved with the project. Um, they can attend events, help me with surveys, that type of thing. Uh, we have a particular emphasis on monitoring species and we monitor over a dozen of our target species on this area um, because GWCT has the resource to do that. Um, so we very much hope that since our big baseline in 2017, uh, this can be a, a long term study. Um, so these are some of our early findings from our monitoring. Uh, some stuff is going in the right direction, some is all over the place, thanks to the uh, beast from the east and the crazy summer heat wave of 2018, I suppose. But this reiterates the need for long term data. Um, so all this is presented and it's explained to the farmers, along with positive feedback and encouragement and conservation advice. Um, so they get this in a report every year and um, Actually, if, if anyone's interested to see the type of report that I give them, I'm, I'm happy to share um, a redacted version that the farmers have given me permission to do. Um, so, so this really accelerate, uh, accelerated farmers' learning, um, their understanding um, of their own farms and a drive um, to conserve in their local area. So as a sort of summary of what conservation action has happened since 2017, we've Put around 200 acres, 80 hectares in um, of new habitats, grass buffer strips, flower margins, beetle banks, arable flora margins, which also function as turtle dove plots because we've got one of the last remaining populations of turtle doves in the south, arable reversions, net flower mixes, wild bird seed plots, um, supplementary feeding, nest boxes and predation control. As an example of how we've put this into practice, um, these are this is a cor the northwest corner of, of the cluster area. Um, you've got two different farms there. Um, at one end of the cluster is Garston Wood Trust SI, which is um, a woodland managed by the RSPB. And then Kitsgrave is the northern end of Martin Down. Um, and in the middle, we've got uh, private woodland um, and arable reversion, which is wildlife rich. Um, and both farms uh, decided to do a coordinated landscape scale uh, mid-tier application and you can see how much of a network of wildlife corridors have been put in there if I flick this animation. And this is a mixture of all those types of habitats that I've just outlined. Um, you can also see in the top um, a slightly uh, different coloured farm, that's actually a farm in the Chalk Valley. So it's, we've got to think sometimes a little bit bigger than our own cluster. Uh, the next point, I just want to go into um, an example of how we can collaborate, um, not just between farmers, but within other parties as well, um, with the example of the small blue. So it's a very small butterfly, its sole food plant is the uh, kidney vetch. Um, and on the map of the cluster there, you can see some black dots. Um, and apart from Martin Down, you can see um, that we've, we've got four sites within the cluster area where they are likely to breed and or confirmed breeding. Um, so we'd very much like to um, help those re-establish across the cluster area if we can and we have got some good potential areas. We've just got to reintroduce kidney vetch um, using a, a variety of butterfly banks, um, wildflower margins and arable reversions. So here is an example of partnership to achieve this. On the end there, you can see Roger and Claire, some farmers, uh, they put in a pond, generated a large amount of spoil, um, which they created two large butterfly banks with. Um, so we thought, what should we do with that? Well, we'll turn it into a, a micro habitat for small blue. And they're quite enterprising little butterflies. So even though this is over a kilometer from Martin Down, we reckon they're gonna find it. So we've got to establish kidney vetch. So in partnership with the NNR and the Warden, um, which is partly managed by Natural England and partly managed by the Council, um, we collected some seed. 
picking up seed. Um, then one of the members of our friends group, uh, Jill, um, offered to grow some of that seed into plug plants for us. Uh, so the plugs are on there, the seed is on there, and it's all growing really well. That's a picture of one of the plugs. Um, and throughout the whole process, I've been involved advising and facilitating those four parties um, to better create this habitat for small blue. And if we can get, you know, four or five new sites for small blue in, in the next few years, that will be a, a significant achievement for this threatened butterfly in our cluster area. Um, now, I'm no, I'm no psychologist, but um, I've learned a lot from working with a di uh, diverse um, group of people and uh, psychology and people management is half the challenge in this type of project. And um, if many projects are anything like mine, there will be challenges. <laughs> um, so to overcome them, you need to build the trust um, you need to build relationships. One-to-one -one advice is just as important as one-to-many. Um, find what makes people tick, uh, listen, um, encourage and reward. And there, I don't think there's been enough encouragement and enough reward um, in agri-environment schemes to date. Um, so hopefully this way of working, this attitude, this bottom-up principle um, has to be easier in ELMS. It has to be embraced within ELMS. And final thoughts then, um, so as I was saying about those resources that are available and the Land App uh, Farmer Cluster website and um, the advisory service here at GWCT are here to help um, new and existing groups and anyone with an interest in farmer-led collaboration um, and landscape scale conservation. Uh, surveying and positive feedback, definitely in our experience, a catalyst um, for progress. Collaboration will feature strongly in ELMS, um, and groups are well placed to trade in uh, natural capital and receive private sector funding. Um, Tim's asked me to chair a roundtable discussion on the 19th of May um, from 11.45, just for an hour, um, featuring some great people. Uh, Rob Shepherd, who's one of my uh, farmer chairmen from the other cluster I look after, uh, Gemma Batten from the Marlborough Downs, uh, Brian McDonald, uh, who heads up the facilitation fund, James Phillips um, from Natural England Nature Recovery Team, who's been extremely supportive um, of our Martin Down project. Um, AJ Paul, um, who spoke at the first Farmer Cluster Conference, um, farmer and facilitator, and our CEO, Theresa Dent, um, from the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, who's also on the Natural England board. So that will be a really, really good discussion. Finally, um, we joined Twitter not too long ago, um, so we'd love you to uh, engage on Twitter, follow us, see what we're up to, um, and thank you very much for listening. Jess, thank you so much. Um, fascinating talk, as always. Um, on, on Jess's point about the roundtables, yes, we're just launching this new component to the series, um, and everyone will be notified via email after this webinar uh, with information about how to find out more and register for that. Um, so yes, thank you very much, Jess. So now we're going to hand over to Geraint Richards from the Duchy of Cornwall, who's going to be presenting landscape scale planning and trees, trees in the landscape. So Geraint, I'll let you start sharing your screen. Fantastic. Here we go. Brilliant. And if you just, ah, there you are, muted. Brilliant. I will let you start. Well, thank you, uh, Tim and Matthew, for organising this excellent land management webinar series. And, and I suppose, Matthew, thank you for kindly volunteering me to participate. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the recently retired head gardener at Highgrove sent me a text saying that she and her husband had found this wonderful word and thought it described me, nemophilist. So I looked up nemophilist, and if you don't know already, it means a person who loves or is fond of woodlands, forests, forest scenery, and who often visits them. A haunter of woods. Well, in that case, I am a self-confessed nemophilist. And certainly when I began this role as head forester for the Duchy of Cornwall some 24 years ago, most of my time was spent managing and whenever possible visiting the Duchy's forests. Over the years, however, and under the inspirational leadership of His Royal Highness, my role with the Duchy has changed. And whilst I still have some 6,000 acres of woodland to keep watch over, 
some of which you can see on your screen now surrounding Restormal Castle. Our office in Cornwall is just below that castle and uh, takes us back to the origins of the duchy in 1337. But, but whilst I still have those woodlands to manage, my job these days is far more about creating and maintaining trees in the landscape, or what I like to call a treescape. So rather than speak to you today about the duchy's approach to woodland management, I'm going to focus on what we are doing to put trees in the wider landscape. Now I could spend the next 10 minutes explaining why having trees in the landscape, why having a treescape is so important. I could explain the role of trees in mitigating climate change, not, not just carbon sequestration, but carbon substitution, as we use wood and the building blocks of wood, cellulose, lignin, etc., as substitutes for concrete, steel, fossil fuels, conventional plastics, and so forth. I could talk about the benefits of trees to air, water, and soil, to flood mitigation and temperature regulation. I could talk about the immense biodiversity that trees and woodlands support, and increasingly understood by us today, how they greatly benefit us as human beings, our own health and well-being. How many people during this current lockdown are appreciating their local green spaces to a level that they hadn't done before. I am, however, going to take it as read that you don't need enlightening about the many and varied benefits that trees, woodlands and forests deliver. The issue is how do we create this urgently needed treescape? And I deliberately use the word urgently because over the years there has been a significant loss of trees in the wider landscape. Our nation that is poorly wooded, the result of many centuries of deforestation, is now also losing its non-woodland trees. The combined effects of natural mortality, pests and diseases, catastrophic weather events and human activity, both, both development but also intensive farming activity, has greatly diminished our stock of landscape trees. I'm not old enough to remember a landscape pre-Dutch elm disease, but those who are old enough to remember those times, uh, they talk about such dramatic change, such, such detrimental change to the landscape as a result of that disease. And perhaps my parents-in-law's house name says it all, lost elms. But we are all now living through another similarly tragic episode as our wonderful native ash trees succumb to ash dieback and think about the effect that is going to have on our landscape. In our businesses, we often talk about succession planning, making sure that the next generation of workers have been planted in our companies and established long enough to succeed those who retire. Such succession planning is, however, sadly lacking when it comes to our treescape. It may, it may just be down to ignorance, given the age trees live to compared to human beings. We just don't realise that there are less air than there used to be. It's the shift in baseline syndrome at work. It may be deliberate. Some people even regarding trees as a costly inconvenience and best removed. Whatever the reasons, action is needed now. For as the proverb goes, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. It was in 1980 that the Duchy of Cornwall purchased Highgrove as a home for His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. And over the past 40 years, a treescape has most definitely been created there by His Royal Highness. Many, many miles of hedgerows have been planted, all containing hedgerow trees that are carefully protected during hedge laying activities. Garden trees, parkland trees, field trees, roadside trees, avenues and orchards, as well as new woodlands, have created a sylvan landscape where it did not exist before. For His Royal Highness, and, and thinking back to that proverb, every year is a now year when it comes to tree planting. For His Royal Highness's 70th birthday in 2018, we planted three avenues in provenant locations on Duchy lands, one in Cornwall, one near Bath, and one just north of Ross-on-Wye in Herefordshire, the one that's in your image now. 
it was an interesting and encouraging experience to have a number of people contact the local office as the avenues were being planted, expressing their gratitude that such landscape features were being created. Last year, His Royal Highness celebrated another milestone as due to Cornwall. And to mark that occasion, we planted a significant tree uh, near the farmstead on every principal duchy farm across the whole duchy. There's no better way to mark a significant event than by the planting of trees. And, and His Royal Highness, I, I can assure you, he hasn't managed to visit all of them, but he has been keen to, to, to see any of these trees when he's made farm visits over the last 12 months or so. These are just some of the images of the trees that we've planted, perhaps one of my favourite ones here now. During last week's webinar, my colleague Jeremy Clivero spoke about the natural capital project that the Dutch is undertaking. And opportunities for tree planting are regularly being identified as this image now shows you. This is a baseline survey of one of our farms. It shows you the features that are already there. If I move to the next slide, this shows you the sort of um, opportunities that Jeremy is identifying. Uh, and they include hedges, woodlands, um, hedgerow trees, orchards, wood pasture, parkland, etc. There's great potential to still do more. This autumn, at the behest of His Royal Highness and in delivering elements of our natural capital project, we are embarking on a hedgerow tree planting campaign that will run for several years. And I'm showing you here very honestly some areas of duchy land that show we desperately still need to do more work. This is, this is a farm in Herefordshire where, where trees are, are greatly needed on the landscape. Another image there. It's just not, the, the, not just the rural estate, however, that needs uh, the tree scape. Trees play an equally important role in the urban environment. And as the duchy undertakes development, for, for instance, at Cambry near Dorchester or, or, or Nansledden in Newquay, in your, in your picture now, the green infrastructure is an integral element of the design proposals from the outset. These are sites, uh, this is Newquay here, that's an avenue we planted in Newquay a few years ago. And this is actually now um, a site near Truro, it's actually a development site but also a park and ride for the city and contains a Waitrose uh, store. Um, but we have kept the, the uh, green infrastructure in hand and we're doing this our work ourselves. Planting trees, planting hedges, to try and beautify the site. There's even an orchard and a woodland being planted on that site. In planning and creating a tree state, there are several factors that need to be taken into account. And I just want to flag up a few now, drawn in part from my own experience to date. Firstly, choosing the location for your trees. As, as I was drawn into this world of planting non-woodland trees, any naive thoughts I had about the simplicity of the task were, well, they quickly evaporated. Laying out an avenue is really quite difficult, as is planting trees on new development sites and, and even planting trees in existing hedgerows. Besides the usual site factors that one would think about, soil, water, aspect, exposure, etc., one has to take into account that the farming operation that takes place within that field, the, the stock that are grazed, the machinery that is used, even the chemicals that might be applied. One has to think about the proximity of possible tree planting locations to properties and roads, the presence of underground and overhead services, the, the need for visibility at road junctions. We might be trying to create a view, but we might end up blocking a view from a home or a vehicle. So before you start, think, plan, because we want to create beauty, not liability. Secondly, though, selecting the species of the trees, and I don't intend to dwell on this because this is a huge subject, and, and, but it is one we need to give serious attention to. The climate is changing, and that doesn't simply mean it's going to be warmer. We are all experiencing these more dramatic, even catastrophic weather conditions. Prolonged dry periods, prolonged wetter periods, sudden storm events. Inextricably linked to this is the issue of tree health. We are currently facing an onslaught from plant pests and diseases, and it's appropriate that I mention this to you today, given that 2020 was designated by the UN as the International Year of Plant Health, although the current human health crisis has understandably stolen the headlines from the plant health crisis that is nevertheless raging. Within the duchy, we are not wedded to native species only, but nor are we placing our hopes entirely in new introductions. Moderation in all things. 
perhaps a key message that I would convey today is the need for species diversity in order to build resilience into our tree shape. Some of the avenues we established include five different species, quite unusual for avenue planting. We've got at least 18 different native or naturalized species in our, in our plans for our hedgerow tree planting. And, and linked to all this, be, be vigilant with regard to biosecurity, especially where you are sourcing your trees from, because we don't want to inadvertently spread a, another pest or disease across the landscape as a result of our tree planting efforts. Thirdly, don't forget the aftercare of your trees. I, I'm something of a stuck record when it comes to this matter. Whenever I hear an announcement about some tree planting target, this many trees, that many hectares, I, I respond, it's not simply about planting the trees. In some ways, that's the easy part. It's the aftercare. To ensure that those trees survive and thrive, that's critical. How much tree planting that began with good intentions end with bad results? In planning, in costing your tree planting, don't forget the aftercare, especially with these landscape trees because they are more than likely to be grown in public areas or beside properties, roads, such like. And the need for ongoing maintenance will be greater than in a woodland situation. And then fourthly, communication. Remember to tell people about your trees. Inevitably, such tree planting affects other people. And it's best to have them informed and hopefully enthusiastically involved from the outset. Be aware that the farmer who doesn't really want any more hedgerow trees can do a lot of damage in a very short period of time with a hedge trimmer. The communities that understand why you are planting trees are more likely to protect and cherish them. Location, species, aftercare, communication. There's so much more that I could say on this subject, but I just hope that the uh, above provokes some thought. Planting trees in the landscape does require thought, much thought, but, but, but you know, don't think for too long. Because remember, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Thank you. Geron, thank you very much. An incredibly informative talk. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, now we have uh, John Tucker from the Woodland Trust, um, who is going to be presenting the why and how of woodland creation five things to consider. John Tucker Woodland Trust, this is going to be a whistle-stop tour um, through woodland creation. Um, it's not an exhaustive list at all, but there are five things that I'm going to look at that I, I think people need to consider if they're thinking about creating new woodland. So the first one is, why are you doing it? What are your objectives? You've got to be really clear about your objectives right from the start. Second thing is assessing the site that you're thinking of creating that woodland on. Is it actually capable of delivering uh, those objectives that you want to achieve? Thirdly, if the site is capable, um, what sort of systems might you implement on that site uh, to try and achieve those objectives in the longer term? Fourthly, we'll look at permissions, planning and finance. And then finally, ongoing management and maintenance. Geraint's already touched on this, but you can never say enough about this subject. So first of all, let's think about objectives. Um, uh, Geraint sort of touched on this. I'll just go into this in a little bit more detail. So historically, people will have created woodlands for, for timber, for biomass, for wood fuel, for shooting, sporting interest, for example, or for wildlife. In the last five or 10 years, it's been great to see how carbon has come to the fore, and it's been really good to see Forestry Commission launch their new Woodland Carbon Guarantee, which is going to help um, get some long-term income streams coming into new woodland creation, payments for up to 35 years ahead, which is fantastic. A little bit more of that later. Um, but this series of webinars that we've been engaged with here have also looked at a wider range of benefits that trees and woods can deliver. Um, water is a, a case in point. So the UK loses 2.9 million tonnes of topsoil annually. A lot of that ends up in our water courses and reservoirs, and it's a cost to clean, and it's a cost to the landowner that's losing it. Trees and woods in the right place can help alleviate that, and water companies are beginning to realise 
that greener solutions to this problem can be as cost effective as concrete solutions and again potential income streams to landowners. Bottom right, it's also worth thinking about the shade value that trees and woods can provide as well. Um, species such as salmon and trout are very temperature dependent and could be really adversely affected in a warming climate. Just to finish up on the benefits, it's worth mentioning a whole range of other things as well. Um, if we think about a warming climate, what are the impacts going to be on milk yields of dairy cattle, for example, and where might uh, infield trees and woodlands help provide some shade? Um, uh, winter shelter for outdoor lambing in that first 48 hours when the lambs are born, incredibly important. We're also starting to look back at some of the stuff that our forefathers knew about the medicinal and nutritional value of tree fodder. We're working with the likes of the Nottingham Vet School on this, looking at things like the amount of cobalt and other trace elements that species like willow might provide. Um, the egg box is an example of a diversification project. We've been working with Sainsbury's on the woodland egg range for probably 12 years or more. Uh, it's now a multi-million multi pound product line. And the little oak tree you can see is oak. Um, so uh, you may not realize that most of the troubles in the world actually come from cultivated woodlands rather than more natural woodlands. Um, we cultivated uh, some of our oaks with uh, truffles. We're still waiting for the results. Um, so moving on then, uh, you've got your objectives. You need to start thinking about the site and a whole range of attributes of that site are going to determine what you can do and how successful you're going to be. And I've listed them all there. Um, now, there are lots of websites that you can go to to start to get that information. Uh, the Land App is a good example, Forestry Commission Land Information Search and magic.gov.uk. Um, some of them are less easy to, to sort of find information on and require more thought, particularly things about landscape character, scale and sense of place. And the next couple of slides are courtesy of Richard Hellier from Forestry Commission. So you start to bring that information together into a site appraisal plan. This is for a large productive upland um, forest. So it's starting to bring together the, the attributes of that landscape. So um, important habitats that you don't want to plant on, access points, archaeology, in landscape, uh, rivers, views, um, etc. So trying to bring together all those attributes into an easily visible plan. From that, you move on to the design phase then, design concept plans. Um, and it's useful if you can do not just one concept, so you've got everything fixed, but a few options for yourself. So here you can see um, the number one area is the extensive coniferous forest, and then you've got broadleaf forest to, to help complement with other habitats and to bring it into the landscape, um, and then your open habitats as well. So you're already started through that concept um, discussion and planning, thinking about the systems that you're going to use to try to implement uh, your scheme. Um, so many and varied can be depending on what your objectives are. So this is a stock farm in uh, Yorkshire, quite exposed. He wanted to try and introduce more shelter onto his farm, but also to extend an informal shoot on the farm. So he's concentrated on hedges, new hedges, and relatively small shelter belts and copses. And we'll come back to this again later. Um, and again, you don't need massive areas of land to achieve your objectives. Um, this is the uh, site in the forest of Boland in Lancashire. Uh, it's an intensive dairy farm, and there were real problems, as you can see, on the banks with erosion, but also nitrate runoff. So a relatively small area on either side of the river was fenced. Um, trees planted, and you can see eight years um, hence down the road, the improvements, uh, certainly to the, the water quality and to the erosion. This is an important salmon river, and there's been noticeable in, improvements over those years. Now, you can, of course, do things at a much bigger scale. Uh, this is up in Cumbria. You can see the M6 in the background, not far from T-Bay. This was a 
um, a soil uh, erosion alleviation scheme, slowing the water flow, but also with a strong biodiversity element to it. So a lot of the planting here is native broadleaf, but you can also have very extensive coniferous planting. Um, this is a site, Gerra Farm in the Scottish Lowlands, that's Falkirk in the background. Um, and uh, it's extensive conifer dominated by Sitka spruce, but there are broadleaf plantings, particularly in the lower levels, um, more closely to the, the communities. There's been a lot of talk about agroforestry systems in recent years as well. Um, this is, I suppose, at the extreme end of that. This is Stephen Briggs uh, near Peterborough. Um, Stephen's got strips of arable, uh, strips of arable approximately 34 to 36 meters wide, and then rows of apple trees planted on either side of those strips. Um, he's still able, as you can see here, to have those combinable crops, but he's got an additional crop in terms of the fruit, which he sells at his farm shop. Um, and he's also got significant improvement in his soil erosion problems. This is a more juvenile agroforestry scheme, similar to Stevens, the, the Renaissance up in Perth. That's the River Tay in the background. Again, fruit-based with the produce going through um, a local, uh, local distillery. But agroforestry can also mean just increasing hedges around the farm. This is in mid Wales. Um, again, exposure, wanted to try and limit that um, for his outdoor lambing. And it could be just individual trees along the roadside. This is on grade one, two soils up in Norfolk, um, and the landowner particularly wanted to leave a legacy in the landscape. So fourthly then, just moving on to permissions, planning and finance. Um, if you're planning anything of any scale, it's really useful to talk to your forestry commission office or go on to the Woodland Creation Hub that they have um, right at the start to find out as much information as possible. The EIA legislation was changed in 2017. Um, and if you're in what's designated a sensitive area in England, any woodland creation, be that half a hectare, um, you, you will need to go through an EIA inquiry form and full screening. Um, if you're in a less sensitive area, um, then the, the threshold is two hectares or more. So it's worth having conversation with them right at the start to find out where you stand. Um, planning grants may be available to help you with your planning. So there's up to a thousand pounds for the first desktop stage. If you get through that stage, there's up to 30,000 pounds available to help you plan um, uh, after that in a second phase. It's always important to get professional advice to help you. I'm a chartered forester. If you go onto the chartered forester's website, there's a great list of consultants there but also talk to neighbours um, at, at an early stage. Talk to local interest groups who can have really good information about other habitats um, and local interest uh, in terms of history. Key thing is give yourself time. Um, there's quite a crowded grant landscape out there. There's some good finance available. Countryside stewardship can cover up to 80% of your initial capital costs. There are schemes which will give you 100% of that cost. Again, go online to the Forestry Commission Hub um, and talk to your local Forestry Commission officers. If those schemes aren't suitable to you, if you're thinking about planting only a small area, then the Woodland Trust have a more wood scheme, um, which looks at things in the sort of range of about half a hectare up to three hectares. The website is there. Um, or talk to us if you need more information. So just to finish up then, uh, Geraint's mentioned this, you can't mention the need for management and maintenance too often. So we've all seen, unfortunately, schemes like this, tubes left on, constricting growth, tubes not straightened all over the place. Um, the, the bottom right one is a Woodland Trust site where we've tried to combine shelters with sheep and it's a nightmare because the sheep love rubbing their bottoms up against those stakes. Uh, you're wasting your investment if you're not going to put aside finance to look after what you do. 
if you do look after it, you'll get results like this. So top right is the farm in Yorkshire that I talked about. These trees are only 11 years old. Um, he's high pruned them, brushed them. He's already started taking firewood thinnings from them and they're forming part of his shoot. And then bottom left, the cricket back willow um, down near me in Sussex. Some of the trees look a bit wonky in the picture, but they've all been high pruned. These trees in year 17, 18, probably 350 to 400 pounds each. Um, so it just shows the benefits of looking after what you do. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Happy John, thank questions. you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so if anyone has any questions for any of the, um, the presenters today, please do ask them in the Q&A um, function. We're just going to go quickly on to the last Slido before we go into the Q&A. So we haven't got a huge amount of time, so I am going to do this a little bit more briefly than usual. So I'm going to share my screen. Now, Jess firstly has a question, which is, uh, let me just quickly paste this into the chat so everyone can get access to it. And just remember, everybody, that all you need to do is um, open your chat function, um, click on the link. It should open you up into your browser where you can answer. And failing that, you can take a photo of the, uh, the QR code with your phone, and hopefully that should allow you to then answer the on, um, slide on your phone. So Jess's question, what things should we survey and monitor on farmland to better inform land management? So um, if you just open your chat function and then take the link and then just paste it into your browser, you'll be able to answer. So soil, species, water quality, gray partridge, soil analysis, wildlife, water quality, soil health, natural capital plants, birds, insects, farmland birds, soil health, worms, habitat, invertebrates, natural capital. Fantastic. I say we're going to have to keep this a little bit briefer than usual. So do please answer quickly, quickly. And uh, you can answer more than once as well. Okay. Fantastic. Soil biodiversity, soil health. Brilliant. Great. We'll stop that one there, I think. And we will go into the next one, which is Geraint. So back into Slido. So I'm now going to hit that. Um, copy this. So this is a link for Geraint's question. So let's just jump into there, into the present mode. And again, just take that link out of the chat function. So this is what are the key issues that that need addressing to create the treescape that I've described. So Brian, if you just take the link, open it up into Chrome or something like that, and then you can answer the questions in there. So what are the key issues that need addressing to create the treescape that I've described? Funding, financing, management, education. Garen, this is on the topic we were discussing this morning. Yeah. Funding and education are really front and center. Finance, management, cost, brilliant. Okay, planning, very interesting. Okay, thank you, everybody. And now we're just going to go on to the next question, which is John's question. So I'm just going to play on that, share, and again, just going to copy this link, oh, copy this link into the chat function. So again, just scoop that out of the, the chat function, paste it into your browser. Oh, present mode, someone's answering beforehand. Sorry, slightly behind. So this is John's question. Name one thing that could, could make people create more woodlands. Simpler grants, money, funding. I think I'm seeing a theme here. Um, knowledge, knowledge, money, funding, simpler grants, money, <laughs> pound signs, Simpler grants, tax relief, interesting. Timber markets, education, money, finance, simpler grants, public access, funding and education, knowledge, understanding. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. I'm just going to stop that one there. Now, the next um, thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a poll. So I'm just going to quickly ask this. So the two questions are, I'm going to launch the poll right now. Um, so the first question is, do you know anyone who would like to be listed as a case study on our website. So a lot of you are saying case studies. So if you know anyone that either you would like to be a case study on our website, so you manage a holding, you do it, you know, in a particular way, you'd love to present yourself the way you do it. 
If anyone would like to be a case study on our website or knows anyone that can be, do say, say yes and I'll email you directly afterwards. So the second question is, um, would your organization like to be listed as a friend of or a supporter of the um, Transforming the Future of Land Management webinar series and again listed on our website? So if you're interested, to say yes and I'll email you directly afterwards and we'll get your um, company logo loaded up onto our website with information so that people can get connected. So we'll do that for three, two, one. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. I will email you directly for those who said yes. Um, yeah, we look forward to you being on the journey with us. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, so it's uh, Q&A time now. So um, if I could invite our speakers back. Um, I'm going to start with Jess. Um, she's had the longest to prepare for her uh, question session. So uh, Jess, um, first question, how can other groups and organisations contribute to the farmer cluster uh, sort of approach? Um, so, um, well, my immediate thought would be um, help us contribute to the farm cluster website. Um, please come and speak at our next conference, which will now be in 2021. Um, there are a number of ways um, that you can keep up to date with what's going on. Um, I definitely recommend um, being part of uh, the newsletter and the blogs. Um, we'd love more case studies, um, particularly hot topics at the moment, things like community engagement and monitoring, which other groups and farmers um, really want to know more about. So if anybody has some good tips on those, um, we'd love to get that input um, and have a focus on that on the website and at the conference. Um, but yeah, we're here to help. We're, we're here as an advisory body to get this to get this movement going. So um, do approach the advisory team at GWCT, um, Natural England, if your query concerns them. Um, and yeah, just keep talking about it. <laughs> um, so next question is coming from Tim Coates. Um, um, he asks, uh, do you think that farmer cluster areas are too large in the current scope? I think they're um, bigger than 5,000 acres. Um, should, and should Elms incentivise smaller clusters, which could then join together at a later stage? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's a trade-off, isn't it, between having um, a greater landscape impact, um, but also retaining the local um, cohesion, the social cohesion um, that keeps groups together and keeps them um, interested and invested in their local landscape. So, um, so it is a trade-off. Um, in my experience, I would say that um, our approach um, where we've got smaller clusters, we've got, you know, a dozen um, people in each of our clusters. Um, I would say that's a really good number for keeping people around the same table. Everyone has an equal say. Um, and yet um, by conjoining the efforts between the three clusters um, as a collective, we can have a much bigger landscape scale impact. So, yes, um, forming smaller groups. Um, you can still achieve that that bigger impact um but yeah ultimately it is a trade-off isn't it <laughs> and I mean, grace um talks about well i mean just at a personal level it's fascinating to hear you talk about the psychology of changing changing mindsets and how important it is to to do that and, and, and a big part of that is is obviously bringing your groups together uh, mm -hmm. so they can collaborate they can learn together um and, and grace asks what what the recent restrictions mean in terms of your work and, and how that's affecting your farmer engagement and, and what you're doing instead in terms of getting people together. Are you using Zoom? Are you, are you doing anything like that? Um, so actually, um, I'm sure my farmers won't mind me saying this, but a lot of them are technological dinosaurs. Uh, so Zoom is not a good idea. Um, however, um, we've just set up a WhatsApp group for all of uh, the cluster members of of the Allenford group and that's going great they've all been sharing pictures so that's a nice way for people to keep in touch um, uh, it's quite lucky for me because um, I go out and do a lot of monitoring on the cluster areas um, wildlife surveys um, so I do tend to see them anyway quite a lot through the year so I, I'm lucky I'm able to get out on the ground and keep them informed as, as to what's going on but okay. um but yes yeah so if, if anyone can think of any novel ways to remotely keep in touch um 
during this time that would be another great thing that we can put on the website and, and help other people with so yeah we'd love to hear your ideas um, and just a final final technical question from Ben um, do you think that the supplementary feeding approach that you talked about um, has any long-lasting benefits or would the money be better spent on longer term sort of habitat improvements yeah, so um, GWCT, as you know, has um, done a lot of research over the years um, into the three core things that, that wildlife needs, um, habitat, uh, food and protection from predation. Um, and, you know, it is a quick win, as it were, to put in supplementary feeding. It can be a really good way of making species more resilient um, and putting them into better breeding condition particularly with regard to turtle doves in our example in, in Martindown. So, um, it, you know, not everyone can afford to put in um, uh, the natural foraging areas that they have. So supplementary feeding has huge value for, for turtle doves if it's done correctly and with the best advice and in best practice. So it definitely has a place. Um, you know, it, it is a bit of a, a, a band aid on a, on a bleeding wound kind of situation but if we can put in emergency measures like supplementary feeding um we would hope that that will will make all the difference in the long term well um, i'll come back at the end on on the the, the, the question of predation uh, if i may jess um Geraint, if i could turn to you now um you you talk about the urgent requirement to plant this treescape and uh you know that that time is now but what about the nurseries do they have the capacity um, and do we run the risk of a rush to the continent uh, and the plant health issues that that might bring? There's been quite a lot of questions around the plant health uh, aspect of, of, of that rush for planting. Yeah, well, thanks, Matthew. And yeah, I'm a bit of a stuck record on this one as well, because um, whenever I hear all these uh, wonderful, don't get me wrong, wonderful tree planting aspirations, whether at a, a county level down here in Cornwall or a national level, my, my questions sort of are, where, where's the land, where's the money, where are the skills, but also where are the trees? Um, the nursery uh, are, are struggling and COVID-19, I hasten to add, having come off a call today, is not going to help matters. And when you're looking at, you know, forest transplants, you probably need at least a two to three year lead in in order to collect the seed and grow them. And if you're looking at landscape sale trees, bigger, bigger trees, you, you, you know, you probably five to ten years to grow them. So, um, you know, this, this cannot happen overnight. And the danger is that we then rush to overseas nurseries not all of whom are bad i hasten to add there are reputable nurseries on the continent who we will who, who the country will still need but nevertheless a lot of problems have come in from us rushing to bring in trees from abroad so we do need desperately as well to develop our homegrown nursery sector and uh it's diminished over time a lot of the, the small local nurseries have gone and we need to support it again and and, and see things um sourced and grown in the uk um, and just turning to, um, I mean, it's something I know that, that Jeremy's picked up on in um, in his sort of visions for um, for natural capital within the duchy. But what do you feel the role of agroforestry is in the UK, sort of post cap in Elms? Well, I actually think that the role, the, the potential for agroforestry is huge, and it's something. And John's mentioned it. I'm something I'm incredibly enthusiastic about, but something that we we just have not taken up enough in this country and that I don't think is embedded enough in, 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 in Elms or other policies. John mentioned Stephen Briggs. I've been to Stephen Briggs and seen his work. Um, you will know, Matthew, that there, there are areas that Highgrove, His Royal Highness, has developed with agroforestry. And I think this ability in a, in a world, a COVID-19 world, where we're increasingly, I think, thinking again about food security. You know, how can we can combine food security with the growing of trees that we desperately need to um, mitigate climate change? Well, agroforestry is one of the great answers it's a great use of land using the horizontal and the vertical so it is it needs to be more embedded in schemes going forward and, and, and more supported there's a lot to do in terms of education as well education is a theme that we we picked up on throughout this um throughout the series actually so it's interesting you mentioned that um just uh dale had a question uh concerning sort of forestry's many benefits to society to the environment uh, as you've rightly identified in in your talk um Grant funding obviously helps establish new forestry in new woodlands, but the benefits of existing forestry is largely taken for granted. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of how that might be funded? Well, yeah, I'm bound to agree. And, and with the, um, the current correct obsession with increasing woodland cover and planting more trees, which we do need, we seem to have forgotten that still a huge amount, particularly of England's woodlands, are under-managed or unmanaged. 
and could offer considerable more social, environmental and economic benefits if they were put into management. There are many hindrances to that, you know, lack of knowledge, access, all sorts of things that um, funding and education could help. But, but, but I'm always in the, in, the, in the camp that we ought to, you know, um, look after what we've got. Um, before we necessarily start adding to it. In this case, I think we've got to do a bit of both, really, but, but, but definitely they are undervalued. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, John, if I could turn to you. Um, during, the, uh, during the general election, um, all the parties uh, committed to huge planting targets um, for, for, for woodland. Uh, whilst welcome and encouraged, uh, I'm sure, by, by, by you and, and, and the rest of us, how can it sensibly be planned and coordinated to achieve the best outcome? There are there are numerous agencies out there. What, what, what do you think is the best way of doing that? Yeah, a, a really good question. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of targets, of numbers. Um, to me, it's all about quality rather than you've got to get that right. Um, I, I think there needs to be much more collaboration across the sector. And by, by the sector, I mean farming, forestry, and NGO sector as well. Um, you know, we're, we're notorious for siloing, doing our own thing. We need to come together much more. I was really interested in Jeff's talk about the, the farm clusters, you know, and I've not really engaged with them at all, but I think that could be a really good sort of mechanism for talking to a group of landowners um, about issues like trees and woodland. And I think, you know, we're, we're edging there in terms of some of the catchment scale work that's going on um, around water issues. So, so I think we're, we're making some tiny steps, but there's a huge amount more that we need to do. Um, question, um, in, just in terms of the impact, I mean, um, Garant talked about the, the potential impact on nurseries in terms of uh, coronavirus. Um, do you think there are any other impacts out there that, that, that we're, not, we're yet to see as a result of, of everybody having been in lockdown for so long? Um, I think, you know, on the positive side, I've really been amazed at how much contact we've had with people saying, you know, it's been great to be able to pause, to look around them a bit more and to appreciate what they've got in their locality. Um, they're appreciating nature, they're appreciating being able to walk to a woodland. So I think it's really put the focus back on the role of trees, woods and our environment for people's mental health in particular, and for also for giving people much more access to nature, um, yeah, close to where they live, you know. Um, so I think that that's been a positive. Um, in terms of negatives, it's just, you know, we're at a time now, we've still got Brexit ahead of us, there's lots of uncertainty. It's just added another layer of uncertainty into the whole decision-making process, I'm afraid. Yeah. Landowners, have got so many options, they don't know which way to turn, they need advice, often that advice can't get out to them on site. So good and bad for me, but I remain optimistic. Good. Um, Ed uh, from Cumbria um, asked the question, that do, do we fight the tree line? Um, the trees at T-Bay, um, he, he happens to know that site quite well, quite a lot of the tubes are blown over. Um, just thinking about that more widely, but also climate change, and, and to what extent um, do we need to be taking that into account when we're thinking about tree species? So, so I, I, I think we, we can fight the tree line, but it depends upon your objectives. Um, I noticed that, you know, if you think about some of the work that the Borders Forest Trust have been doing, for example, in Southern Scotland, about some of the elevations that they've gone up there, um, and started to create woodland. So it's about getting your species right, getting your provenance and seed sourcing right. Um, I noticed there were some questions about natural regeneration. I think we should be using that a huge amount more, but you need to start getting the sort of some seed source up into these places. Um, and interesting to Ed, thank you for the note about the tubes. I shall make sure they are checked out. Brilliant. Um... Well, thank you. Um, I'm just going to put a question to, to, to all three panellists now. Um, uh, Charlie, Charlie Burrell uh, has posed the question about your thoughts on, on natural regeneration. And John, um, in fact, you know, 
a lot of the photos we've seen today, you know, tree tubes are very much in evidence, but just just the, the, the panel's thoughts just very quickly on, on natural regeneration and plastic tubes. So I'll start with Jess. I'll start with Jess. How's that? Sorry, Jess, you're just on the uh, still. Oh, Jess. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Am I off mute now? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, on, on the subject of, um, of natural regeneration, as I said earlier, um, in the ELMS discussion document, um, tier three seems to make good mention of landscape scale. Um, if there are any particularly ambitious groups of uh, farmers and land managers out there that would like to have a go at, um, you know, large scale, what we call wilding or uh, natural regeneration, um, to follow in, in the footsteps of places like NEP, then, then who knows, that could well be possible in Elms and indeed perhaps even encouraged. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, um, cluster groups, facilitated groups of these kind can lend themselves to so many initiatives out there, so many schemes, um, and natural regeneration is just one of them. So, yeah. And uh, go right. Oh, well, yeah, no, well, on the, on the, tr on the plastic tubes, um, no, it is a problem. I mean, we, we've all used them and uh, they are a tool for getting woodlands established, but there is a real issue with plastic pollution now. And we would, we, we certainly, as you know, Matthew on the Dutch are looking at what we can do to um, establish our trees without using plastic or we wait for a truly biodegradable product to, to, to come about. Uh, natural regeneration, definitely, it's another tool in the toolbox, but you know, still needs some thought. What is the seed source? What's actually going to grow? I mean, if you had a Western hemlock stand nearby, you're just going to grow Western hemlock. You might not want that. So, um, so what, what is the species that's going to grow? What about predation still? Um, and, and what next? What are you going to do with it, uh, it when, when, when it does regenerate? Are you then going to intervene later? But it's another really important tool in the toolbox and, and one we need to understand better. And John, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I've, I've already alluded to you. Actually, um, I was actually scheduled to go and see Charlie at NEP for a visit um, a couple of weeks ago, which is unfortunately cancelled. I, I agree. I think we should be using it a lot more, um, but there are lots of things that we need to learn about it, as Garant has alluded to. Um, seed sources in particular are important, um, but I think it could be something that we should be doing a lot more of. I just think we've got to some of the language about how we describe it, um, rewilding for example can put some landowners off so it's about how you take landowners with you um but but i think it has a, a huge amount that it can offer but we also need to be thinking about other things direct seeding for example you know we've we've touched on that in you know the last 20 years but never really got to grips with it so yeah the sooner we can get rid of plastics in our forests the better brilliant well, on, the, on, that, uh, on, on that note, I will uh, draw the Q&A to a close. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank all of our guest speakers today. Uh, that, that's been fascinating. We've got lots of questions that have come in that, of course, we haven't had time to answer. But what we're actually doing is we're, uh, take, we're capturing all those questions and our speakers are going to be asked to answer them offline. And they will be made available um, at the end of this series. So uh, you will hopefully see your question um, answered uh, in the... Uh, in the future. Um, so thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, a recording of the session will be uploaded to our website as well. Ne next week's seminar is on the subject of business demand for resilient ecosystems and we've got Andy Brown from Anglian Water and Andy Griffiths from Nestle talking to us. Um, we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible next week so please do share uh, to your wider networks. In the meantime thank you to Jess, Garant and John and it's a goodbye from Tim and I. Uh, please stay safe, stay well, and enjoy the bank holiday weekend. Thank you very much. <laughs>